Good morning, and uh, thank you for joining us today for our Sunday morning worship service. Uh, I trust that everyone's uh, happy, uh, healthy, uh, well uh, in these days. Uh, praying, of course, that each and every one of you are filled with uh, the peace, uh, the hope, the joy, and as we'll see in just a moment, the love uh, of this uh, wonderful season. And, uh, of course, the light uh, of this season uh, as well. We've been, uh, for these uh, uh, past weeks, uh, considering uh, the advent, the coming, the arrival of uh, Christ Jesus our Lord. And uh, it has been uh, for, uh, for centuries that the church has uh, celebrated uh, this uh, four-week season of Advent by... Uh, lighting uh, the candles in uh, a wreath, uh, much like the one uh, behind me, and uh, just reflecting on the coming of, of Jesus, as we're told in the scripture. Uh, I've mentioned uh, at least uh, a few times during these past weeks that the circle uh, of that wreath uh, represents God's never-ending love for us. Uh, the evergreens represent Christ's gift of eternal life, and of course the candles that we've been lighting uh, each week announce Jesus uh, as the light of the world. Well, here we are in the fourth uh, week of Advent, and of course, uh, as we've been lighting these candles, uh, our thoughts have been upon uh, hope and peace and joy, and uh, this morning, uh, love. Love, John 3, 16, it says, For God so loved the world uh, that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And that verse tells us that Jesus came because God loves us uh, so much that he doesn't want anyone any of us to miss out on spending eternity, on spending forever with him. So all we have to do is believe. Believe that Jesus is the Son of God who came to save us from sin. You know, God's uh, love for us is really one of the, one of the main themes of the, that the Apostle John wrote about in the Bible. Uh, he tells us in John chapter 15, verse 13, that the greatest love that anyone can have is to give their life for others. And he also tells us in his first epistle, 1 John chapter 4, verse 7, that we're to love one another because love comes from God. Well, let's pray uh, this morning, and then we'll get into the uh, get into the word. Uh, Lord, uh, we thank you for your love. There are no words uh, to describe your love, but thank you. Thank you for loving us so much. Thank you that you uh, you give us a love that's beyond anything that we can experience here on this earth. It's a love that's beyond us. It's a love that, that comes from, uh, from far off, a different country. <laughs> really. It's supernatural. It's beautiful. It's perfect. Thank you for loving us as you do. Thank you, you know, that you take us as your, as your own. We fall. <laughs> we fail. You stray, you see us in our weakness, and you, you don't abandon us, you love us. You see us in our struggles and in our troubles, and you love us. You see us in those moments of joy, gladness, triumph, <laughs> you love us. Always love us. I 
pray, Lord, that uh, we would be a people who would reflect upon that love. From out of that love uh, comes so much. It's truly nothing like it. And so we're, uh, we're just so grateful and uh, as people in awe of your love for us, I pray that we would know that love. Along with it, the peace, the joy, the hope of this season, of this life that's in you. Uh, may we uh, not live like a, a people uh, who are hopeless, restless, <laughs> joyless. Lord, help us, uh, help us to live. It's a, this eternal life that's given to us in love. It's, it, it's a life that, that really begins now. It's this abundant life that we're given here. I pray that we would, we would know it, that we would live it each and every day. Uh, thank you, O oh God, for this morning. Uh, may our time in your word bring you glory and honor. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And of course, uh, the hope as always is as we go into God's Word that we would uh, be drawn ever nearer, ever closer to Him. So, uh, we're going to be uh, reading this morning from uh, Matthew chapter 2. So, beginning in the first verse of Matthew chapter 2. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw a star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people, Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. Uh, after they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. And coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and, and, and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with the gifts of gold and incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream, not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Uh, may the Lord, as always, add his blessing to the reading of his word for us this very day. You see in that first verse of Matthew chapter 2 that Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod. And this Herod was known as Herod the Great. And he was called king because the Roman Senate had appointed him um, as such uh, on the recommendation and the influence of Mark Anthony. He wasn't at all the rightful king of Judah. He wasn't at all in the Davidic line as we find that the Lord Jesus absolutely was. Uh, you see that in Matthew chapter 1. Herod was a wicked man. He was, <clears throat> excuse me, cruel, crafty. I'm going to leave this for a moment to grab my water. <clears throat> he 
But history tells us uh, that he permitted absolutely no one to give him any advice or to uh, interfere at all in any of the affairs of state. He did everything, Herod, on his own, in his own way. Even his family wasn't allowed to say or have a say in anything that he did. Uh, it was, in fact, that when they began to uh, attempt to influence his decisions and prevent some of his evil desires and the satisfying of his own lusts, that he had his own wife murdered and her two brothers slain because he suspected them of high treason. We know from history that he married at least nine times in order to fulfill his lusts and to further strengthen his political alliances. So it really ought to come as no surprise at all that such a king would plot to kill the true king of the Jews, our Lord Jesus Christ. He wanted to kill the Lord Jesus because he knew that the Lord Jesus rightfully owned the title, the king of the Jews, and he was afraid of losing that title himself. Now, Herod himself was not a Jew. He was an Egyptian. He was a descendant of Esau. You know, Jacob and Esau, uh, as you well know as readers of God's word, were sons of Isaac and Rebekah, and the first twins that we see, I believe, mentioned in the Bible. And even before they were born, they were struggling together, the Bible tells us, in the womb of their mother, which, uh, of course, foreshadowed uh, later conflict. Now, friends, in, in light of that, uh, we need to see this morning that we have here in the birth of Christ to a nation which was ruled by a wicked king, what we see is not, none other than the, the great universal struggle, friends, that's always existed. And that's the struggle between the spiritual and the carnal, the flesh, the struggle between the worldly and the godly. And in fact, if you and I were to read through the rest of this gospel account, we actually find that the reaction of Herod mirrors that response uh, of Judaism to the Lord Jesus Christ, how they would reject him, how they would resist his reign in uh, the nation, not only in the day in which Jesus was born, but of course also even at his death and resurrection, actually to the very uh, day and uh, hour uh, in which we live today. You know, Christ is still rejected in our world today. We have a great many things on our minds in these days as believers, along with everyone else. But don't forget, even in the midst of all of this, all these troubles and trials and dire circumstances that surround us in these days, that people are still remarkably rejecting Christ, even in these days. But maybe that's no surprise. You know, from the hour that Christ was born to this very day, there's both homage and hatred that's existed for him as the Son of God. Friends, where is the King of Kings today? You know, where is he in the eyes of men and women today? Where is he in the eyes of nations today? Where is he in the eyes of politicians? Where is he in the eyes of presidents and rulers across this world today? You know, he's still, still in these days hated and rejected by some by many. Spurgeon, 
uh, on this uh, matter of how kings so very seldom regard the king of kings in their lives. He said, too often do they serve themselves or Satan and forget the God whose sufferance permitted them to wear their mimic majesty for their little hour. Spurgeon nails it every time, right? I mean, those are, those are words that absolutely apply, you know. And I think today's rulers would really do well to hear the words of uh, Proverbs chapter 21, verse 1. I'm going to read from the Amplified. Proverbs 21, verse 1. And I read this last week, I believe, or at least the week before. The king's heart is like channels of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it whichever way he wishes. You know, friends, even though, you know, rulers, leaders, uh, presidents, and if we're thinking of these times past, kings and countries may reject him and blaspheme his name. Friends, our God, our great and mighty God is still in control. And our God, as I've said week after week during these days, our God always keeps his word. Our God always honors his word. He keeps his promises. These first two verses of Matthew chapter 2, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one? who has been born the king of the Jews. We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Now that word uh, magi that we're familiar with, it referred to the priests and the wise men uh, among the Medes, the Persians, and the Babylonians. We don't know everything about the magi, but from history, uh, we do know from the Babylonian to the Roman empires that they maintained a place of tremendous prominence and significance in the Orient. The Magi were the key people in the Eastern governments. They rose to a place of enormous political power by virtue of their very unique priestly function, powers of divination, and knowledge of uh, both astrology and astronomy. And now, during the four world empires, they served in a powerfully influential capacity as advisors to the royalty uh, in the East, consequently earning the reputation of being wise men. The Magi were so powerful that historians tell us that no Persian was ever able to become king except under two conditions. He had to master the scientific and religious uh, disciplines of the Magi, and he had to be approved and crowned by the Magi. Uh, it, 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 you may be interested to know that the Magi actually appear uh, a number of times uh, in the Word of God, in uh, Esther uh, chapter 1, verses 12 through 14, uh, in Jeremiah chapter 39, verse 3, and later in verse 13, in Acts chapter 8, verses 9 through 11, in Acts chapter 13, verses 6 through 11, and of course uh, we see them in Daniel chapter 2. But, you know, it, it, in fact, it, it, concerning Daniel, you know, you have Daniel's position and influence over the Magi that no doubt, of, you know, it really ingrained upon them that knowledge of the one true God and precipitated their search, perhaps many years later, for a unique king. I don't know. I don't know. That's inference. But... The typical uh, representation of the uh, Magi arriving on the three camels is, uh, I, I would say, a far cry uh, from what the scene likely was. Uh, the Magi were uh, no doubt, and I've said this in years past, but I, I always, uh, to think upon it, 
and, and, and the scene and what it must have been. You know, the Magi were just no doubt traveling in full force with all their uh, oriental pomp, you know, wearing those conical hats and riding the Persian steeds rather than camels that we might think of, you know, and then accompanying them. You have uh, the historians that estimate that there could have been upwards of a, a, a thousand mounted Persian cavalrymen acting as bodyguard. And, you know, friends, that's why Matthew's gospel very quickly follows up their arrival in Jerusalem by saying, when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. You know, you have to imagine, after witnessing this very impressive entrance of the Magi and hearing their, well, their primary question, Herod probably panicked. I mean, would you think? He absolutely he knew full well who these men were. He knew full well the power that they wielded. Moreover, they asked. Remember their question. They asked for the king of the Jews. They asked for the king of the Jews, which is really the exact title given to Herod uh, years earlier by, uh, uh, by Mark Anthony and Caesar Augustus. Further, you have the Magi's declaration that involved this uh, divine spectacle of a star that announced this new king, which challenged Herod's political rule even more. And then to make matters even worse for Herod, history tells us that his army was out of the country. Oh, he was shaken. He was disturbed. Uh, also in verse 3 of Matthew chapter 2, we read that not only did uh, Herod uh, reject uh, the Christ child, but seemingly not only Herod, but the whole nation. The whole nation did so as well. The text says when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed. He was shaken to the core and all Jerusalem with him. So, you know, much of the time, uh, you know, we're, we're led to believe that the nation of Israel was just waiting for the Messiah. You know, they, they'd waited for so long. They'd suffered so much and they were just waiting for this Christ who would deliver them and actually and to some extent this is true absolutely no doubt but the fact of the matter is that when Christ was born and the announcement of his birth was made the people themselves were disturbed and again the word for disturbed here uh, in this verse is, is the Greek verb that means to to agitate back and forth to shake to and fro so here we have this emotional agitation from getting too stirred up inside you know they were crying for the Messiah they were longing for the consolation of Israel and the deliverance from uh, the Roman bondage but then when he actually came they were perplexed about what to, what to do with them. What do we do now? You know, and I wonder if it's the same for us today. You know, we're God's people today, and we're looking for his second advent, right? And, you know, we're waiting for the Lord to come. We don't know the day. We don't know the hour. But we're waiting for the day when the Lord returns. But if he did come today, how many of us would be disturbed? How many of us would be just agitated, stirred up on the inside, shaken to and fro? I, um, I really love to see here in this passage how uh, God Almighty, sovereign God. He overrules kings and countries to fulfill his word, His will. And uh, it's, it's just wonderful that we can uh, uh, 
We can take the word of God and so accurately apply it to ourselves today. And we can say, he still does. He still overrules in every way. We live in, you know, we live in a nation. Um, and it's not only our nation. You know, there are nations around the world as well. But, you know, if you consider our own country, we live in a nation where there's a tolerance for nearly everything. And again, I think that stretches across countries around the globe where there's a tolerance for nearly everything, except there is barely a tolerance for the Bible and the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think uh, uh, the prophet Isaiah's uh, words are true today, as they were true back in his day. He said, Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20, Isaiah 5, 20 says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Friends, that's exactly the same thing that's happening today. All the laws and, and the principles of the Christ child are still still being rejected by so many. Now, listen, if we really, really allowed these things to just uh, penetrate our minds and our hearts, we would just easily despair and just, and just think, you know, what's going on? You know, things are bad enough, and now, you know, and, and thanks for the reminder, Pastor, that there's still, even in the midst of these terrible days, you know, people who are rejecting Christ, you know, all, all hell seems to be let loose, right? Chaos seems to be reigning. But friends, 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 even in the midst of it all, I will say again, on the authority of God's word, that God still honors his word. He still honors his word. You know, there's a, there's a prophecy that's uh, yet to be fulfilled in Daniel chapter 2, where there was that, um, there's a great image that represented four kingdoms that would um, dominate uh, the known world in that day. Well, uh, by the time of King Herod, you know, they, you know, that were seeing here and, and reading of in the second chapter uh, of the Gospel of Matthew, they had all arisen successively and had each replaced each other. And the greatest of them, the Roman Empire, you know, was now reigning. But Daniel pointed forward to a day beyond Herod's day when that Roman Empire would be uh, revived again, and all the forces of, 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 of Antichrist would be let loose across the world. But then Daniel says, In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of a mountain, but not by human hands. A rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. And friends, that rock, that stone is Christ. That's a hallelujah moment. You know, that's, that's awesome stuff. You know, God honors his word even when uh, rulers, leaders, kings, countries blaspheme. And friends, God also honors his word even when the righteous apostatize. And uh, apostatize means to, to stand uh, far from the truth, to disown it. To reject it. We read in verses 4 through 6 of Matthew chapter 2 that by order of the king, 
uh, the, uh, the chief priests and the teachers of the law were called uh, together and in a special session uh, and they were commanded to show uh, from the scriptures where Christ would be born. All of them, it would seem, started to look up in, 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 you know, in Micah's prophecy, in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, and the answer comes, in Bethlehem, in Judea. Now, I want to make, you know, and like you to take note that the chief priests and the teachers of the law, they were all in agreement concerning the location of Christ's birth. They had a perfect knowledge of the scriptures, but friends, it was only a knowledge that they had in their head. That's it. You know, uh, you know their, their consciences were not touched by the knowledge that the word of God gave to them. Who? Who among the chief priests and who among the teachers of the law, who among them went out to pursue the Christ? No one. None of them followed the Magi in their homage to the King of Kings. Friends, you can have so much head knowledge. You can. We all can. But it means absolutely nothing unless there's something in your heart of, you know, that's of, of, of the light of God's revelation. You know, it, it doesn't matter how much you, you know if you're not actively following, pursuing the Christ. Right? You know, uh, so having ascertained the, uh, the general location of Jesus from the Old, you know, from both the Old Testament uh, prophecies uh, given to them by the Jewish leaders, and the star that they originally followed, the Magi found their king, but not in a manger. They found him in the house in which Mary and Joseph evidently lived, verses 10 and 11 of Matthew chapter 2. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and, and worshipped him. They opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and frankincense and, and myrrh. All of Jerusalem was disturbed about this thing, and yet, and yet, the Magi were joyous. They were joyous. You know, and you see, friends, that reveals the way their hearts were in relation to Christ. You know, our attitude toward the Lord, it absolutely reveals the condition of our spiritual lives. A true Christian is not just someone who believes, it's not just someone who knows a Christian is someone who has a love for Christ. A love for Christ. Do you love Christ? Do you love him today? Because if you love Christ, you'll follow his word. If you love Christ, you'll worship him. And it won't just be a head knowledge. No, 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 no. But you'll see the guiding light of the star of Christ and you'll follow it wherever it goes, friends. Wherever it goes. You know, Christ came at a time when, when, when kings and, and countries were blaspheming his name. He came at a time when the righteous were uh, apostatized. And when the whole entire uh, religious establishment was just crumbling. That's when he came. Christ came when he was most needed. These were dark days. You know, uh, the, the nation was very sick uh, at, at heart, and really the only solid hope left was cherished in, in the hearts of some uh, uh, very devout uh, Jews who were looking 
like Anna, like Simeon, right? You know, they were looking for the consolation of Israel, for, you know, for the Messiah from their hearts. You know, they, they needed him then. And friends, we need him now in, 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 in our country. We, we need him now in, in our churches. I know a lot of our church buildings are empty, but we're the church. The church, the people. Are we empty? We can't be empty. We need to be filled with a love for Christ. We want to be having, we need to have hearts that are actively following him, pursuing him moment by moment, you know, day by day, hour by hour. You know, you know, they lived. And we live, quite frankly, in a time of, uh, of indifference and, uh, and opposition and, uh, you know, apostasy. But, you know, I think still it's very comforting that even in the midst of, uh, of such despair, God was still honoring his word. Even in the midst uh, of such apostasy, God was still honoring his word. They could not, no matter what, they could not thwart the sovereign purposes of Almighty God. You know, it, it's somewhat uh, ironic, friends, and, uh, well, really amazing, uh, that some of the first people in the world to recognize uh, the King of Kings were Gentiles, not Jews, right? You know, the Jew, you know, here you have the Jews, they had it all. They had, they had the Torah, they had the writings and the prophets, and they were standing there in the midst of their Messiah, and what? They couldn't even travel uh, five miles to see if it was him. You know, history reflects the irony of rejection uh, John in John chapter 1. Uh, verse 11, John 1, 11, where it says of Jesus, he came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. While Israel and uh, Rome uh, may have uh, recognized uh, Christ as king, God declared his son's royal presence by bringing the Magi from the East to acknowledge it. And, and no, matter, no matter what these men's uh, background uh, was, you know, they, they were seekers after the truth, and God rewarded their desire uh, to find the light uh, in the light of the Christ child. Uh, friends, uh, you know, do we, do we follow the, the light that God has given to us. I want to apply this uh, in our moments here as we get uh, get ready to close, because it's uh, it's easy when we live in a day like you know. Like the day of Christ's birth, a day where still, even in the midst of all these things going on around us, you know, there's still uh, leaders and, and countries that blaspheme, uh, you know, still a day when the righteous uh, apostatize. And it's easy, you know, in such a dire and, and dark circumstances to, to get down and, and to get discouraged. Um, Absolutely. But God honors his word, and he does it uh, often in unexpected ways from unexpected uh, sources, you know, especially in times like these. You know, the, the, the means may not be uh, uh, sure. In fact, it may be absolutely uh, unnatural, right? And implausible. Uh, but friends, one thing is for sure, if God has promised it, it will come to pass. In uh, Matthew chapter 2, verse 12, we read that having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, 
they return to their country by another route. Well, what happened next? Well, Scripture doesn't say, and it doesn't record the Magi coming back. Uh, Watchman Nee said, you know, those who have seen the Lord cannot go back to Herod. Right? And so I might ask you this morning, well, well, what is your Herod? You know, what's the cause of your darkness? You know, is it fear? Is it doubt? Is it anxiety? Is it despair? Is it a... Um, is it a sin that pulls you down time and time again? It's a temptation. Well, the answer is go to Christ and see how God honors his word in his one and only son, Christ Jesus, our Lord. And then, friends, all your harrods, whatever they are, all the despair, fears, doubts, anxieties, um, these habitual sins uh, that drag, you know, you're dragging temptation time and time again. Whatever it is, all those Herods will never, ever get an upper hand again. And the reason why is because all of the promises of God are honored and they're fulfilled in Him. Each and every one. Fulfilled. I, uh, we see, friends, that the uh, the wise men they, they saw his his star rising, his star. I I just absolutely love that. You know, you know, it's it's his star. You know, tomorrow uh, evening, uh, we have this uh, great uh, conjunction, right? Jupiter, Saturn, two of the largest planets, you know, coming so close, so near, in fact, they'll, they'll, uh, they'll appear as, as one star uh, above the horizon. What the star that the Magi saw, you know, I, I, I couldn't say. I don't know. It's a mystery. But maybe as uh, some of us are, uh, are looking perhaps uh, upward and, and heavenward uh, tomorrow, at least a, a thought, a reflection on what could, could be. You know, God... Uh, God does incredible things, mighty things, unnatural, supernatural things. Staggering, really. Whatever it was, it was his star rising. His star. The star of the Messiah, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Christ Jesus. And uh, may we uh, continue to pursue, continue to follow that guiding light. Uh, let's go to the Lord uh, in, uh, in prayer this morning. Lord, we, uh, we thank you uh, for this uh, day. We, we thank you for uh, your wonderful uh, uh, words uh, to our hearts. I pray, Lord, that uh, we would be a people who would uh, continue to follow you, to pursue you, May you continue, Lord, to be the guiding light in our lives. Uh, we want to be a people who continually trust in you, who know that you'll keep your, your purposes, and your purposes will prevail no matter what. Your will will be done no matter what, no matter what the hearts of of 
earthly uh, leaders, and even the hearts of the righteous that, that turn and at times refuse to believe. Whole nations of people that would still reject you. It's, it's remarkable. Even in the darkest in the, uh, of days, in the direst of circumstances, that people wouldn't turn to you. We need, uh, we all need the hope and the joy, the peace, to know the love and the light of this season. But not only this season, but all seasons, all seasons of our lives. We uh, continue to be a people who follow you, who seek to obey your commands, and to know your will for our lives. It will reveal a heart that's for you, truly for you, a heart that's pursuing you, that wants to know you, that wants to be near to you, Lord, I don't know. Maybe perhaps this uh, this light that'll appear in the, in the sky tomorrow, so close to uh, our celebration of Christmas. Maybe, maybe it's just a reminder to keep lifting our eyes heavenward, not on the things of this world. Maybe it's just a time to reflect that you're truly the light that shine forth in this darkness. Uh, we thank you for, for everything and all that you give us in the past, in the present, and in the days to come. give this day to you and all the days uh, we look forward to a, a blessed celebration the birth of our Lord and our Savior uh, may, it, may it fill our hearts with much joy and gladness in Jesus name Amen